I welcome you all to this course on microscale transport process. Let me give you a brief introduction of what this microscale transport process, I mean why this course is important to you. Firstly, this momentum, mass and energy transport in sub millimeter size system or channel under a driving force that comes under the purview of this course. The subject received significant attention over last decade due to miniaturization of sensors, biomedical implants, making of novel materials and structured catalyst. There are several other applications as well. These are some of them I could think of uh, right now. There is one important application that uh, primarily uh, put this subject in a uh, primarily added a lot of importance to this subject, which is uh, known as lab on chip. That means entire biochemical laboratory on the surface of silicon or polymer chips. What that means is that think of a, say a somebody doing a blood analysis. The way it is done is the blood is taken in a bottle and then it is kept in a pharmacy shop. Then some reagents are added to it and the analysis is done on that sample. So, you, some, the patient goes there, gives the blood and wait for a day and after a day the results come that okay, this is, this, is the, this is the result. Now, if there could be a chip, uh, maybe in a simpler way I can think of a say a credit card type object in which the reagents are already loaded and the blood sample is just added, a drop of blood sample is added inside the chip. And, that, and then this, this, re, this reagent gets mixed with the blood sample inside the chip itself, inside, inside the credit card itself, uh, in, inside the credit card like object itself. And then, the, the, then it gets mixed and finally it is left inside, inside that chip at some place where it, the sample can be optically interrogated, I means something similar to swiping of the card inside a scanner. So, if this instrument is sitting on doctor's table and the patient goes there, he can go, he can, he can give the sample and immediately he can get the scan done and immediately he knows what the disease is. I mean, some, th this is, this is a kind of paradigm shift that is possible in, in day to day analysis. This is just a, I mean, just an example, blood sample. It could be just an effluent coming out of a chemical process plant. Chem chemical process. Uh, uh, out of a chemical plant, some effluent stream is coming out and then that stream needs to be analyzed. So, you take that in a bottle and then send it to the laboratory. It takes, uh, it takes some time. By that time, there could be some changes taking place within the sample itself. You never know. And then it goes there and it, it goes, to, goes all the way to the, to the lab and uh, then it would be analyzed. So, they are, they are, they are, instead of that, if you can have a scanner and a chip and you go to the field where the effluent sample is coming out and if you can, if you can get the scan done there, that nothing like it. So, that is kind of uh, the idea behind putting this lab on chip, what, what is mentioned here in this slide. Entire bio or ke entire chemical laboratory on the surface of silicon or polymer chips. Uh, why people got enthusiastic about this idea is that it can leverage the techniques that are developed over years for silicon based microelectronics industry. If you can, you, if you can arrange transport of electrons so precisely inside a chip, so why not doing it for a laboratory analysis. So, that is, so we can leverage the, leverage the technology that is already there, people have been developing for microelectronics industry to accomplish accomplish the right design or right uh, production uh, technique for lab on chip. So, and, and there could be polymer based chips as well. Instead of silicon based, you can have this chip made of polymer, which is cheaper and easy to produce because it, if it is a biodegradable polymer, it can be used, it can be made on a use and throw away basis. So, these are some of the things which is driving this, uh, driving these, these micro scale, uh, micro scale processes or micro scale elements. Uh, the major uh, major uh, concern here is that uh, major interest here is of course the miniaturization of sensors as I pointed out, biomedical implants and making of novel materials and structured catalysts and there are more more interesting areas that are coming up. 
However, this lab on chip is one such example that I put here. So, when we get to this micro scale uh, transport process, uh, I mean, you are already familiar with transport phenomena. You have already studied transport phenomena. Uh, the way it is different, this micro scale transport process, the way it is different is that uh, there are certain scaling laws which I need to visit first. Uh, the scaling law, I can put it like this. If you write surface forces, divided by volume forces by surface forces i mean surface tension gradients or shear forces shear stresses and volume forces are gravity inertia so if you write this you will find that this is proportional to the numerator is proportional to l square where l is the length scale numerator is proportional to L square and the denominator is proportional to L cube. So, this is equal to basically L inverse 1. So, if L tends to 0, this implies that L inverse tends to infinity. So, what this means is that volume forces are uh, volume forces become unimportant as you reduce the length scale. However, surface forces become dominant. So, this is something which you have to keep in mind that we are more keen about accounting the surface forces rather than the volume forces in this process. Another issue here in this uh, in the, in, the, in the micro scale transport process is that fluid is not a perfectly continuous structure. Instead, it is composed of several molecules. You remember in fluid mechanics class, we have studied Lagrangian formulation at, and Eulerian formulation, right? So, when you go to a reduced, when, when, you, when you reduce your channel size, and I mean we are talking about L, L tending to 0, when you go to that level, whether the continuum hypothesis stands there or not, that, that needs to be visited. Uh, the What continuum hypothesis in this regard, I mean let me put together, uh, here it is physical quantities such as mass, momentum and energy associated with small volume of fluid containing large number of molecules are taken as sum of corresponding quantities for the molecules in the volume. What that means is, you take a volume around which you would like to know what is the mass, what is the momentum and what is the energy associated with that volume. Okay? So, what you do is you sum up the all the molecules and sum up the corresponding quantities for all the molecules and you call that the mass. That means, you, you, you sum up the all the mass of the molecules and you call that a mass. I mean that is that is the idea of this uh, continuum hypothesis. Now, if you plot, if you plot something called a measuring quantity, okay, suppose on y axis if you are, if you plot something called measuring quantity, and on the x axis, if you plot volume of the probe, okay, so you are using a probe to find out what is the density okay, or what is the pressure at a point. Okay. Now, the volume of the probe, if measuring quantity is plotted as function of the volume of the probe, you find a trend something like this.
if you say if you if you are looking at an atomic force microscopy if, if you look at atomic force microscopy and the volume of that probe you will find that there would be large fluctuations due to molecular structure of fluid you take up you take a volume you take a cube say now you can have the size of the cube you, you can choose the size of the cube if the size of the cube is the one side of the cube cube has cube is l cube basically volume is length to the power 3 if that length l is less than 0.3 nanometer you find that there would be some rand large fluctuations because then what you would be doing is the, the, you would be measuring something where the molecules to which are going in and coming out they will be interfering to the observation so the measured quantity the quantity that you measure that would be affected because of the molecule coming into that cube and the molecule leaving that cube okay however if you increase the length scale if you if you increase the length scale uh, you will find that these variation subsides this this the measured quantity becomes constant the the measured quantity is not changing with the volume of the probe it is it is uh, it, it, you can i mean i can point out that when the side is if a, for a liquid cube of side 10 nanometer that means a cube of one side 10 nanometer that contains approximately 4 into 10 to the power 4 molecules and it has about 0.5 percent fluctuation in numbers okay so if your probe volume is a cube of side 10 nanometer you can expect 4 into 10 to the power 4 number of molecules sitting there inside and the number of molecules should be joining them a number of molecules should be leaving them that number is basically the fluctuation is basically restricted to 0.5 percent for gas to have this same number of molecules and same level of fluctuation you have to have 10 times the length all right so that is that is a typical uh, example i can give now you will consider 10 nanometer side i mean if 0.5 percent fluctuation is acceptable i mean you do not probably care much about it so you can assume that whatever quantity i measured that is just fine but if it is as i said below 0.3 nanometer you will have a very large fluctuation so you cannot uh, i mean you will not be uh, that, that that cannot be that cannot be taken that that kind of measurement uh, i mean that measurement can be it would be interesting to study the uh, other interactions but if you want to take that as the average uh, take a, take that as the representative um, quantity for that area that would be a little difficult however when we go to the higher side of it that means when it is more than 10 micrometer you understand what a micrometer is i take it right you understand what one micrometer is so if it is a 10 micrometer that means you you express that in millimeter how much it would be point point zero one millimeter so if it is above 10 micrometer then i see that the measured quantity it has a turn it, it is it is increasing it is not increasing in a it is not changing in a random manner but it is increasing consistently uh, can you do you have any idea what could be the reason for this increase the re the reason here is that uh, variations in physical properties due to external forces appear suppose there is a fluid flow taking place so pressure at one point has to be higher than the other point right because fluid will flow from higher pressure to lower pressure so these macroscopic changes i mean this this variation in physical properties due to external forces that will become significant so it has to go either up or down i mean i mean the, the parameter will change or it can remain constant i mean if the system if it is a static system if the system decides that yeah, it should be constant that that should that will remain constant uh, but if there is a variation that variation is due to external forces that can that you can take it is not because of molecular interactions 
so this so these these you can understand how the how the length scale how they play out here how the length scale play out here and uh, how these uh, how the measuring quant you have to be careful with the measuring quantity uh, when it comes to uh, comes to working with these these scales and ideally if you if you are looking for a measurement of physical properties per volume it should be in that th this is this is referred as this is referred as microscopic region this is referred as mesoscopic and this is referred as macroscopic so if you want to know some parameter per unit volume you should be working in this region right because you want to capture whether it is increasing or decreasing with external forces so you do not want to play or want to work with this region your probe volume should not be there here but this part would be just fine if it is below this then you will have molecular fluctuations you would be probably uh, this 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 is a very important part this microscopic part if you can really gather this information however if you are treating it as an eulerian uh, fluid then you should be working with mesoscopic region now when it comes to the eulerian formulation there is a definition of field variable there is a definition of a field variable a field variable is defined as the average value of corresponding mo molecular quantity let us say let us write this expression as if rt is equal to average of some molecular quantity where this r prime belongs to this set so here if rt is defined as average value of so this is basically average value of corresponding molecular quantity f this f molecular quantity r prime t for all molecules contained in some liquid particle in some liquid volume of delta v positioned at r at time t all right so what you basically what you are doing is you are picking up a volume which is at position r at time t and that volume is basically delta v within this volume the molecules that are there within this liquid volume the molecules that are there you take them as f so so that mol corresponding molecular pro property is f molecule r prime t and that r prime belongs to that position belongs to this element this volume element all right so if mi and vi mi and vi if they are mass and velocity of mass and velocity of molecule i of molecule i and if i belongs to delta v then you can write you can define density as 1 divided by 1 divided by delta v sum of i belongs to delta v mi and the other expression that you have is say velocity 
as a function of r and t that is given as 1 divided by rho r t delta v sum of i belongs to delta v m i v i. So, what is done here is that you have defined these field variables, you have defined these field variables, one is density, another is velocity and that is defined for all the molecules that are existing inside this volume element delta V. The velocity that we calculate here, the density part is fine, you just sum all the masses and then you divide it by the volume, but the velocity that we calculate here, this is a special kind of velocity, what is that? Right, this is, this is, uh, this is not just average velocity, it is, it is, there is a weighting factor involved in this. You, you, you already, you can, and, and uh, I suggest you check the units to make sure that we have right, ex we, uh, we put the right expression check put the unit of density put the unit of volume and find out that we have written the right expression so this would be the this would be the field uh, this would be the field variable okay now when it comes to measuring the velocity i mean why why we are uh, treating it differently is that when we we when it comes to measuring the velocity this measurement cannot be done by a Peter tube or other type of apparatus because we are operating at a scale which is too small. So, if we want to measure a velocity inside a channel where the length is so small, this has to be done by some other method. The common method which uh, is there in uh, available is uh, available in a sense it comes at a very high price tag is that measurement of velocity using micro particle image velocimetry that is that is the that is the name of that technique the way this technique works is that micro particles with diameters of the order of 1 micron are suspended in the flow micro particles of diameter 1 micron they are suspended to the flow now, there would be a CCD camera that records the through an optical microscope the transmitted or reflected light. All right. So, there would be recording two pictures will be recorded by sending two light pulses in quick succession of millisecond in quick succession which would be a millisecond apart okay and then there would be use of a cross correlation function to determine average velocity at point r how is it done in a ccd camera in a ccd camera the positions are recorded as grayscale values now, if it is defined, say say the time, uh, the two light pulses, they are in quick succession. So, they are at time T1 and T2. So, at time T1, there is a pulse, light pulse and at time T2, there is another pulse. Cor the light intensities in each CCD camera, the corresponding light intensities in each CCD camera. So, light, inten say light intensity is given as I 1 R and in this case, the light intensity is given as I 2 R. I 1 R and I 2 R, R is a particular position and the camera records the light intensity 
So I1 R is the light intensity at a particular position at time T1 and I2 R is the light intensity at time T2 for that same position. What you do next is you write a cross correlation function which is defined as Rn delta R which is equal to average of I1 R I2 R plus delta R averaged over N. What is N? N is you 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 can say you can divide the CCD pixel array CCD pixel array. You understand what a CCD pixel array is? There would be several pixels. So you have an array of pixels. That array is divided into number of interrogation areas. Number of interrogation areas in. Okay. And within that interrogation area, so you have an array of pixels, within that you have identified one interrogation area okay. and that particular interrogation within that interrogation area, you are finding out this I1 at a location R and I2 at a different location R plus delta R. All right, and this is averaged over all pixel coordinates in the given interrogation area n. And so, delta r here is defined as delta r is defined as pixel displacement. vector. Then you choose delta R n such that delta R n is that delta R which maximizes R n delta R. So, you are picking up an interrogation area and then you are calculating this cross correlation function okay and then you are finding out that delta r which maximizes this r n delta r and then you define velocity v for that particular interrogation area as delta r n divided by T2 minus T1. So over this time instance T2 over it, over this time interval T2 minus T1, you are finding out what would be the delta R. I mean, how much the so where the over what delta R the maximum change of intensity has taken place and that you, are try, that you are relating to the velocity. So, this would be the way you will be measuring velocity at a point when it comes to channel of this length scale. All right. So, you can, so similarly, so, so you, can, you will see that there is, there is a shift of the way, the, the way we think about conventional measurements. So, all of them will shift as you go to this length scale. This is, I, I just give you one example how the velocity is, velocity can be calculated inside a micro channel. And this entire, this, um, these pictures are taken through an optical microscope, mind it. So, so you can understand how, how this whole uh, thing works.
what I will do next is I will try to identify some of the application areas that uh, these microscale processes uh, where the microscale processes will be useful. The number one, I mean let me identify this lab on chip application because if I read some review article on microscale processes. If if I if I if I read this uh, if I read any any review article on microscale uh, processes, I find this lab on a chip is something which people find very promising. I mean this this has lot of promise and uh, there would be lot of uh, thoughts put to it. So there are uh, applications which I identified here in this list. There are pharmaceutical applications, R and D in drug development quality control and screening. Uh, in layman's term where what uh, this is all about is a particular drug when it uh, suppose somebody identifies a molecule that this molecule can cure so and so disease. But from that point to having this in market under some trade name that takes long time lot of effort from scientists. because that drug has to be stable inside human body because in human body itself is a chemical factory there are a lot of uh, uh, chemicals uh, floating around inside. So this drug has to dr the drug should not react in a in an unwanted manner with those chemicals. So you have to first ensure what the reactions would be towards various chemicals towards uh, different uh, conditions. So, this drug molecule has to come into contact with various other chemicals and you have to see what would be the product. So, drug screening it, drug screening is a major application where drug has to that, that particular molecule has to come in contact with several other chemicals and you have to study the interaction. So, these processes I mean you can do it in a bottle of course. However, uh, uh, if you do it in a bottle, there are issues like you need more chemicals. I mean, here the requirement of chemical is much small, um, uh, much smaller, and uh, you can automate this whole process in a chip. But there, it has to be done manually or through some robotic arm. So you uh, here the the process can be uh, it, it is this uh, for pharmaceutical uses for R and D in drug development, quality control, and screening this kind of lab on chip could be very useful. The second area of interest here is environmental where water monitoring and pollution control is involved. There you would like to know uh, the concentration of uh, pollutants as it comes out as it is generated. So there I have already discussed this lab on chip would be useful. Then there could be some medical uses allergen detection toxicology, then implantable drug delivery system. This is a very important application. The drug delivery will be done, but it will be done in a tailored manner. It is not that all drug is added to the human body at a time. It has to be released when you want it to be and at the rate you decide. Then flow meters in biomedical implants, how much of drug is released? from where or or the, the biomedical implants are used uh, or are peop, there is huge amount of research going on in biomedical implants for various reasons. Then tailored medication, the, the drug would be released only when it is required or when and how you want to, that, that you decide. It, it, it is not the, the um, nature does not decide rather you control it. Then the life science that has a lot of uh, lab on chip has important application in that area as well diagnosis of disease gene identification. Then industrial pollution control, bioreactors, food composition to check pesticides and antibiotic residue, but testing of food there the lab on chip has uh, important application because again you need to you need to analyze then and there um, at the point where the food is being used or food is being gen generated there itself you want to use it there there itself you want to analyze it 
you, you cannot afford to send this to a lab and wait for two days because by that time the food will perish. The forensic me medicine that is also another for, or rather forensic uh, forensic uh, applications that probably the right one would be forensic applications where the sample is too small and you want to know what that uh, what that is all about a blood stain is there and you want to know whose blood is that so there you cannot afford to have large volume of sample and large and you cannot treat it with a large volume of reagent yet the sample size itself is very small there are other important applications one application is micro reactor okay micro reactor there instead of having a packed bed catalyst where catalysts are arranged in a random manner you can have a structure similar to honeycomb okay with the channel in internal walls of the channel coated with a catalyst there you have a very structured catalyst instead of a random one you can have um, uh, extraction chamber made of I, I'm talking about solvent extraction using these then heat exchanger in electronic circuits that is another area micro droplet as templates you need to generate micro dro droplets in various applications and there these microfluidic devices are important the advantages of lab on chip the advantages are number one shorter time if that has to be done manually if the analysis has to be done manually you have a reagent somebody has to add it suppose 10 reagents are to be tested to find out what is the target uh, I mean the, the sample you have to mix it with 10 reagents to find out with which reagent this sample is reacting and from that you try to find out the characteristics of that sample but mixing it manually it, it will take long time but if you have 10 such channels engraved inside the chip that would be much easier second point is upfront capital investment reduced if you do an analysis using a spectrophotometer which is say which is which can scan over a wide range of wavelength you have to invest that you have to invest some money to purchase a spectrophotometer but instead of that if you can make some instrument which can scan only at one particular wavelength so that way you do not have to uh, you, you, your, your expenditure would be less of course that instrument will not be useful at other wavelengths however if this instrument you want to dedicate that instrument completely to the analysis of that particular sample then it is fine then you are not going to use any other sample so you know this is the optimum this is the wavelength setting so the instrument is meant for analysis of that particular sample so that way you can reduce the upfront ca capital investment suppose somebody wants to analyze water in a swimming pool so he need not have to make a complete lab next to the swimming pool a very comprehensive very detailed lab to analyze the water he can have just a small scanner in which he can analyze the water sample so that that is that is probably the idea people had uh, in their mind when they are putting up these proposals that yes lab on a chip could be useful etc now the next point is close to real time measurements blood flu food and effluent samples uh, you can you can measure as i said you can measure the sample then and there wherever the sample is generated instead of putting it in a bottle and waiting for another 12 hours to get to the lab and next to a the right instrument so that advantage is there small requirement of samples and smaller chemical footprint you use 10 chemicals to find out with which reagent with which one the sample reacts in the way you thought and then what will you do with those chemicals you have to throw them on the I mean, throw them out in the environment so here the chemical footprint would be much less in this if such such type of application is picked up then digital 
output and interfacing with software that is possible because uh, you check the color okay it is changing from uh, red uh, this uh, colorless to purple and you have ways to measure that color but instead of depending on human uh, eyes you can have you can do the measurement in a digital manner so that is uh, that that is one of the objective of bringing this lab on chip in drug discovery small volume of expensive reagents parallel operations high throughput screening and reduced human <coughs> error so in drug discovery this these added features that this lab on chip uh, brings so these are some of the advantages people put together i mean if i if i pick up a book on microfluidic uh, devices i find that uh, they say lab on chip is something which would be driving the microscale transport uh, process research and this is something people are looking forward to of course it is it is not yet available in, in in some places for example in drug discovery people are already using few things uh, there and some companies are already there who are uh, who are uh, in fact in their website they show how they what kind of lab on chip they built the pictures etc but this is something which they which people expect out of a lab on chip and that's why they are kind of getting interested into it all this generally comes under the sensor and uh, controlled release and under the under the subject of sensors and control release okay advantages continued when we go for a microstructured uh, catalyst as i said instead of having a random randomly packed bed you can have a monolith something like a honeycomb with internal walls coated with a catalyst that we call a structured catalyst there you can have high surface to volume ratio which is which means increased catalytic activity and better heat dissipation for highly exothermic reaction if you load the in one place again you think of a probe volume okay if you load your catalyst randomly in some places suppose as the as the as the two streams enter into a packed bed randomly packed bed catalyst uh, pa randomly packed bed of catalyst uh, as the two streams enter it is encountering the catalyst on the way in some volume they find that the catalyst loading is much higher and in some volume they are finding catalyst loading is much lower so accordingly the conversion also would be guided by the amount of catalyst it encounters so there could be if if, it, if too much of catalyst is there then there could be extraneous reactions setting in there could be thermal runaway that means a uh, lot of heat gets generated and if extra heat gets generated and if it cannot be dissipated if it cannot flow quickly then there would be sintering taking place the catalyst get destroyed and also if there is unwanted products generated that that will also result in uh, po poisoning of uh, catalyst so you want reduced coking thermal run away reduced thermal run away reduced sintering and for these purpose if you if you can have a structured catalyst that means if you can have the channels that are uh, if you have channels whose dimensions are all cons all uniform everywhere so in that case this problem does not arise and if you can create more surface area per unit volume in those channels nothing like it so you can you, you give more uh, more catalytic activity induced in this so these are uh, these are the advantages for which people are interested in getting into these microstructured reactors uh of course i mean why they are not getting into this i mean if it's so much of advantages are there is of course the cost because we are talking about borrowing techniques from microelectronics industry and microelectronics industry that will not come uh, very cheap and people are use people are used to having catalyst pellets and randomly packed beds because those are cheaper the other issue here is the robustness of the reactor the if you have a monolith structured monolith the reactor you can expect the reactor to be more robust 
you can have hazardous reactions at the point of use. Suppose some hazardous chemical is required for some use, you need not have to make that hazardous chemical and transport it all the way. You can generate that hazardous chemical at the point of use where you are going to use it actually. Difficult reaction that requires precise control and otherwise difficult reaction that requires precise control and otherwise not attainable. Please change this otherwise it should be otherwise not attainable in a randomly packed bed. It should be not attainable. So, difficult reactions that require difficult re reaction that requires precise control and these re reactions are otherwise not attainable in a randomly packed bed such as making of propellant from carbon dioxide in a space ship. So, this is some this is a some kind of reaction where you need very precise control. So, that kind of control is possible in a microstructured uh, catalyst rather than in a randomly packed bed. Okay. There are other advantages as well and of course, on the desired so nothing comes free disadvantage on the disadvantage side of course, it is there it is the cost. Here I briefly identify the components of lab on chip, the components that are there. I mean that these, these components need to be there otherwise you cannot construct, uh, you, otherwise you cannot accomplish the objectives that I mentioned just now. The components are there has to be some pumping element because reagent and the sample that has to be pumped inside the channel, inside the channels which are engraved on the chip. Then there has to be some valve arrangement, some fluid will flow when under certain condition and it will not flow if that condition is not met. So, these, these imposed uh, flow, uh, I, I mean you, you should be able to control the flow where in wherever location you want inside the chip. Then there has to be some separation modules. Okay, in in conventional mass transfer, we st uh, conventional chemical engineering operations, we uh, th this is a major operation. Separation. Okay, separation. It can be separation of uh, particulates from a liquid stream. It could be other type of separations as well. So that has to be accomplished inside the chip. I will go into the details of these. But let me first point out what all uh, other components are there. There has to be some mixing elements inside the chip. All right, there has to be some kind of mixing element. This mixing is done in a co conventional chemical process, and if you are having sample and a reagent, then sample and reagent they are have to mix. Then uh, there, uh, there, uh, there could be heating. Heating is also another important uh, issue. At some point, the stream may be heated. So, that, that is also one issue. One major aspect here which you probably have not studied that much in a conventional operations is detection because this whole purpose of this analysis is it, it, it is basically sensor right, or a biomedical implant. So, detection is a major component. You have to detect uh, the, the because e, uh, finally the objective is to detect the sample you have collected some sample and you want to find out what pathogen is there. So, whether that, that water can be used or not. So, the pathogen has to be detected. So, there has to be some detection unit which is which probably you are not that much familiar with. So, these are some of the elements that we have and in the next class what I will do is I will discuss one by one how these elements can be arranged in the um, uh, how these elements can be arranged inside the chip. One thing you must uh, remember here that the flow is laminar and the interaction between layers are utilized in most of these components. You will have laminar flow, there will not be any turbulent flow inside the channel and laminar flow means one layer is sliding against the other 
and the diffusion between the layers that you will try to utilize in many of these operations. Uh, with that I uh, stop here for today, in the next class I will go over these elements in little bit more detail and we, we will find out how we can implement these elements inside a chip. Thank you for today.